Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, a philanthropic community partner since 1922, and a proud supporter of numerous community organizations. More information at smithville.com. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. Tonight on the weekly special, explore one-of-a-kind hidden gems all across the state. Discover extraordinary Indiana trees that began life over 200,000 miles away. Meet an incredible artist who transforms trash into treasure. And meet spoken word artist and author Tony Brewer for our latest In Words performance. All this and more is coming up right now on the weekly special. Welcome to the weekly special. I'm Erica Sagone. You know, there's nothing that we enjoy more than sharing exceptional people and places with you. So we start tonight with the story of four Indiana trees. They may not look that different than trees that you see all across the state, but their journey to getting to Southern Indiana was anything but normal. Ignition sequence start. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Launch commit, liftoff. We have liftoff with Apollo 14, three minutes past the hour. Apollo 14 launched on January 31st, 1971. Five days later, astronauts Alan Shepard and Edgar Mitchell walked on the moon, while Stuart Rusa, a former U.S. Forest Service smoke jumper, orbited above in the command module. Packed away in a small container in Rusa's personal kit were over 400 tree seeds. Scientists were curious to know if tree seeds, after their journey into the microgravity of space, would sprout and look the same as earth-grown trees. So they returned from the moon trip and during uh, decant decontamination of the uh, space vehicle, they thought they were destroyed. And they got all mixed up, they came out of the containers and uh, they ended up at a Forest Service lab who they decided to try to see if they would grow. And grow they did. The seedlings, now known as moon trees, were given away. Most of them were planted during public ceremonies in 1976 to help commemorate the U.S. bicentennial. Five of these lunar legends made their way to Indiana. There is one moon tree, a sycamore, still growing on the Indiana State House property in downtown Indianapolis. Three other moon tree locations are in southern Indiana. I don't think anybody back then thought that they were going to be that big of a deal. And so they got planted, um, you know, all over the, the world and country, like I said, and uh, no one really uh, wrote down where they were, or if they did, those records have been lost. So several people have taken an interest in the trees and have documented to write around 80 of them across the country. And we're lucky enough to have these two sweet gums here and uh, three other trees in the state of Indiana. These two sweet gum moon trees are located on the property of the Hoosier National Forest Ranger Station in Tell City, Indiana. Two or three people stop by every year and uh, we're not stingy about them. There's one gentleman that lives in Germany that actually got a hold of us and he was in the States and he's collecting seed from the different moon trees and taking them to germinate them and, and let them live on. So we did help him get some seed from these two trees and I'm assuming other people that have them on their property were equally accommodating. There were uh, seeds that they kept here on earth from the same genetic background that they uh, germinated as well and there wasn't any significant difference. So. I don't think anybody knew at the time, but that was the hypothesis that it wouldn't matter. So you see some top dieback, and it's starting to expand 
which can be problematic. We're going to treat it chemically and then hopefully it'll uh, heal the trees. It's probably been forgotten a little bit, but it's a neat thing to talk to people about when they're here. I, uh, every year I go work with fifth grade classes and I always take a branch off one of these trees and tell them the story. So hopefully that'll live on. Uh, there's not too many people that can you know, claim that they have a couple moon trees in their city that they can just go look at or have a picnic under. It's a piece of our history that I mean, it may not happen again for a really long time, if at all. So I think we need to uh, you know, remember they're here and not, not forget what Stuart did. They're uh, standard issue sweet gums as far as I can tell. They do not drop green cheese balls that I'm aware of. <laughs>just a few miles east of Tell City is Cannelton, Indiana, the home of Camp Cook Girl Scout Camp. That's the location of another Indiana moon tree. If we have uh, people coming up here at the camp, the moon tree is, you know, talked about a little bit. So I know our campers and people that visit ask questions about it. Just the history of being a moon tree, I think, is a good thing for us to relate to, you know. We actually went to the moon, took seeds, put came out, and it's growing, so. I think it's pretty significant for it. One has to wonder, though, if a moon tree needs any kind of extra care. We've just been trying to, you know, get the ground, get the roots covered up, keep it trimmed a little bit from laying on the ground. When the kids are on site, it's well used. We had an ice storm came through here and busted some limbs off it, but it really bloomed again, you know, it just feels, just like every other tree, you know, it just kept growing right back. No little moon martians or anything. What kind of effect does long exposure to a moon tree have on the human body? Another moon tree is located in Lincoln State Park. Michael Cruz, the park's interpretive naturalist, has a long history with this site's moon tree. I know it was the 200th anniversary of the beginning of the country, so it was 1976 and it was a big Girl Scout encampment here at the park. And somehow the Girl Scouts got a hold of one of the seedlings and planted it here, along with a time capsule. And so there were hundreds, if not thousands, of Girl Scouts that were involved in the planting of the tree originally. I know my sisters were involved in it, and I remember it myself as a little kid. I was actually here. Uh, the tree seems to be normal, and uh, you know, it's f fairly healthy as far as I'm concerned. It's still seeding and it's growing. The crown's very large and yeah, it looks like it's doing pretty well actually. You know, maybe they're still secretly looking at it, I don't know. It's uh, on our property maps, our Lincoln State Park property maps as an attraction and people come just to see it. I know that and I get a lot of questions about it. Where's the moon tree? Why do you call that the moon tree? As the moon trees continue to grow, they serve as a reminder of the Apollo program's manned missions to the moon, and as a tribute to astronaut Rusa, while they reach back toward the moon they once circled. To learn more about the moon trees, or to find moon trees in your area, visit NASA's website. It's always inspiring to see life renewed, and our next subject has made a name for himself by transforming discarded material into beautiful works of art. Hi, I'm Gabriel Deshaw, and I'm an upcycle artist. I've always been pretty artistic, but I guess the journey that, that started me down the upcycling path started in ninth grade. My first piece was titled Mary on a Donkey. It really started with a competition within my classroom. My teacher at the time wrote a list of, of different things that I could explore. It was kind of open, and one of those things was junk art. And so that intrigued me, and did some research, and then created a, a piece using recycled or upcycled parts uh, from my garage. I was really looking at what were the scraps or things that were sitting around that I could repurpose, take apart. That, that really involved uh, me taking wire apart, finding really unique uh, pipe fitting uh, materials and so forth. I ended up winning first place in a, in a competition. 
And so that uh, certainly helped uh, to pave the road uh, towards the work that I do now. For me, upcycling really is around this idea of reimagining things uh, as they were maybe in their original purpose or, or design and reimagining those or reassembling those into something different. The creative process for me really starts a couple different ways. It could start with me taking apart or disassembling a piece and I get inspiration from that. There might be subtle objects that cue up ideas, thoughts, it may have the silhouette of a, of a particular animal or, or be a focal point that then allows me to explore further and take that further. So a good example of that is the rearing horse sculpture. That really started with me taking apart an adding machine and from the components there, they really resembled a, um, the basis of a head of a horse. And so that's really what started. It started with that, that exercise and then grew to a full length um, six foot rearing horse. Part of what makes this fun and so intriguing to me uh, is, is around the hunt. One of the ways I find material is uh, by going to like flea markets or antique stores. As I just kind of peruse that, that, uh, that, that stuff, that junk, that throwaway things, it sparks interesting ideas or things that may come into my mind. So the Louis Vuitton series uh, had an interesting uh, genesis or starting point. I stopped at this little resale shop and I uh, came upon this big stack of Louis Vuitton luggage and I was like, wow, you know, maybe there's something here. I could, I could maybe explore something here. Walked out of there with uh, one of the pieces. And within that process of me disassembling it, reimagining it, and actually start to, to build out a piece, there was definitely uh, some energy around this particular uh, approach. And so then quickly uh, called that uh, consignment shop back up and, and, and bought the rest of them. Another approach that I use in my creative process is, is this playoff of colors or uh, mashups of interesting ideas. You can see a lot of that play out within my uh, Star Wars series and evolving that and pushing the limits and boundaries on that. So I continue to, to try to push myself and explore different ideas, different thoughts, different approaches. One of the series that, that I have a lot of passion around uh, is the sneaker series. So I'm, I'm a huge sneakerhead. I've got hundreds of pairs of shoes and, and love, love the energy around that. What I love to do with this particular series is reimagine those sneakers kind of in a digital world or kind of pixelated. Usually that process starts out with me drawing out the design of that and how that would look in more of a, uh, a digital world and then uh, start to build that using circuit boards, usually start with a color palette also in that process. My work stretches past just the actual process and the ultimately uh, creating of the piece and finishing it. I really think about what is that experience when someone gets uh, one of my pieces delivered to them. And so part of that process over the last couple of years, I've really started to look at what does that unboxing experience look like? And so uh, all of my pieces now come in a really nice aluminum box with some of my, uh, my logo on it and usually some graffiti. Certainly think that that is part of the whole package of the experience when uh, purchasing one of my pieces. A driving force within my uh, approach and the materials I use is this idea around e-waste. And one of the missions that I have is to help create some dialogue around that. And that hopefully my work and my creative process uh, helps to influence others around this idea, around finding creative ways on addressing e-waste. That this stuff doesn't necessarily need to end up in a landfill. It can be repurposed, reused, reimagined into something different.
to see Gabriel's latest breathtaking pieces of art or to purchase one for yourself, visit his website, gabrieldeshaw.com. An avid writer, Tony Brewer has touched nearly every part of the publishing world, from his days as a typesetter for IU Press to writing and publishing three poetry books. And to see his work really come alive is to see him on stage. The human body is capable of amazing feats when faced with unrelenting stress and anxiety. It can lift a car off a baby or put a bullet in the brain, should the situation arise, and even realize when a house grown up in is no longer a home and toys once played with were never just toys, and it was never just playing. My wrist is a lever of love ending in a fist of bone and I hold on like grim death. My heart is a filter that intakes the sour atmosphere my lungs inhale, turns into blood or bile or sinews wrapped around the red ribbon of my loose muscles to shield what's left of the egg I came from. I was there only once, and it was night, and I wasn't driving, so let's see if I can tell you how to get back. My mouth is a trap, my tongue the bait, and at the center of it all are atoms, screaming in orbits, praying to their sullen gods they never split apart. My legs are twin battering rams, sparking butterfly tsunamis with each hard soul stride, and the trees I hug are splinters in the skin of the earth, slowly sloughing off this little flake. But a gun is an extension of the fist. Just squeeze and a punch explodes. It's okay if it's only a target. The human soul contains a lifetime, just a moment more, until the vessel drains and refills, drains and refills, drains and refills, and spills over into other cups and pants and jar heads, and so lives on. Ever thumping out the rhythm of a toy drum tattoo, never as regular as we'd hoped, or as easy as a march, and never the home it seems until I'm nearly out the door. My face ends where air begins, and the tension at that last border is a breath and a snort and a kiss at its end, a tame body wrapped in accumulation, like an egg within a shell. The human existence is no trap, and not nearly as structured as a game, and so becomes a catalog of sleep, where the waking mind calls body into being with mechanics, while my weariness strikes hard and deep. And I do grow tired, my friends, my lovers, of these movements of combinations of spiritual permutations and visions, of my sleeping mind still attached to a lizard brain and base of neck, who constantly calls the quarters as if a seance were in effect. And then the table rises and knocks, and I lose the ticking of all clocks, but I never can quite tell where all the noise is coming from. Tony is the chair of the Writers Guild at Bloomington. To learn more about the organization, including their upcoming Spoken Word Stage at the annual 4th Street Festival, visit their website, writersguildbloomington.com. Before we go tonight, we wanted to take a look back at one of our all-time favorite musical guests. They're back in the Midwest touring right now. It's the main squeeze.
The main squeeze will be touring the Midwest throughout the summer. For a list of all their upcoming shows, as well as information about their latest album, Mind Your Head, visit their website, mainsqueezemusic.com. Well, that's all the time that we've got for tonight, but we hope that you're getting out there this summer and exploring all that Indiana has to offer. One more time before we go, the main squeeze. Good night. Turned every stone, you can't find a way. Look over me, no one won't let you go. We're lose together. Look in my eyes and see that I am not afraid. I'm on it always. I will fight past the end and go over the edge for you. Seeking seems many moons away. Look for me, understood through both bad and good. I always got your back. Love can be me, love can be it. Oh no, I will fight past the end and go over the edge for you, my love. Time and time and again, cast aside all the pride and the things for you.
Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, the GigaCity Company. Fiber Internet, HD, and digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you.